take some time to shout out. And if you get tired of it, you can watch the replay and fast forward. But this is a good one. I haven't dealt with the prophetic in a long time. Um, and remember, I used to deal with the prophetic a whole lot um, here on Periscope. And I kind of felt the wind shift off of it. And now I'm coming back to it. And I, I'm still going to be doing um, teachings on signs and wonders and the power of God um, as I've been doing lately. And those teachings come from my book, Jesus in HD. It's um, the subtitle is Prophetic Insight into Revival and Evangelism. And um, you need to go pick up that book. I'm going to be teaching out of it. Uh, the resurrection of the dead, the healing of the sick, the casting out of devils, um, what revival is. I got three whole chapters on revival. So I'm going to be bouncing back and forth here. So I may be scoping a lot more often because I feel a wind. And when I feel that, uh, it's like I'm dumping a whole lot of revelation at one time. And I don't want to try to mix it all in one scope. So I may be on here a couple of times a day. I took a whole week off. So I uh, gave you all a break, so I hope you all ready for me. Um, it's called Jesus in HD, but I want to go back to the prophetic, and I think the fact that my school is pretty much done and is almost ready to be, we're just changing some of the buttons and the links on it, and it'll be up this week. My School of the Prophets will be back up this week. It looks better. It's fresher. Um, it looks a lot cleaner than the first one. Um, I'll do a QA and a if you want to, but, um, it depends on, yeah, I'll do a QA. and a you know, we'll see. I answer a couple of questions, but I want to teach first. I haven't done that in a while. It depends. I may answer a couple of questions. I may do a separate Q&A, but I will be back on tonight. All right, later tonight, but I want to get this out. I think the School of the Prophets has been stirring me again to deal with the prophetic, um, um, something that I studied and trained in years, years, at least eight years before I was ever publicly acknowledged um, to be in the office of the prophet. So this is something that is close to my heart. It's something that um, that is dear to me. Um, can you all hear me? Someone said I had to pull the Manchester. I see you. Yeah. See you later. Whoever that is, who is that? I can't read it. You know, this phone is so far away. The iPad is bigger. Maybe I need to just pray over it, anoint it with some Crisco, and um, try to put it back to work again. Because I can barely see some of these comments. Jesus. But, um, yeah, let's go with it. Prophetic activation. I know some of you are saying um, a lot of people's questions are... Um, how in the world can you teach someone how to flow in the prophetic? Well, I'm going to show you, but first of all, you have to understand that the prophetic is an overflow of hearing, God, of hearing God's voice. A lot of times when people talk about the prophetic, they automatically um, assume that you're dealing with hearing God's voice. But the gift of prophecy, sometimes, now I, know this may, I know this may baffle your mind, it may challenge your theology, but when you're dealing with the gift of prophecy, you're not even dealing with hearing God's voice. The word gift, um, the root word is charis, uh, charisma. Um, one of the definitions is faculty. So just like my brain has faculties, um, it has a speech faculty, learning faculties. And my brain is comprised of different elements that cause it to function. The same way the gift of the spirits are. So you have a gift of the Holy Ghost, and then the Holy Ghost has gifts. All right. And you have nine gifts of the spirit, and then you have some gifts of the spirit that are plural. All right. So like, for example, you have the gifts of healing, plural. So there are nine gifts of the spirit, but there are many gifts of healing. All right. So think of it like a pyramid. All right. So you got the Holy Ghost. You got the gifts that he brings. Now, the Holy Ghost is the gift from the Father. The gifts of the spirit are the gifts from the from um, the Holy Ghost, all right? And then you got nine of those. Then you have gifts of healing or um, working of miracles. That's a plural gift. 
uh, diversities of tongue, that's a plural gift. So some gifts are uh, multidimensional. All right. So think of it like that. And when you're dealing with a gift, you're dealing with like uh, a hard drive or uh, uh, your, a gift is something that is hardwired to function the way it's designed to function. So if I have a gift of prophecy, then my gift is designed to prophesy. All right. I can prophesy without hearing God. That's why gifts and callings come without repentance. All right. I'm not saying you should prophesy without hearing God. Come on. That's rocket. It's not rocket science. Um, but um, I am saying that there are people who can operate in gifts because gifts and callings are without repentance. And it has nothing to do with their relationship with God because their gift is a faculty. It is built to function. The gift of prophecy is built to cause you to function in the prophetic. All right. So you have to know um, when God is talking and when the gift is talking. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. And it's not the same thing. All right. So, um, yeah. So, but the prophetic is an overflow of hearing God. So when you think hearing God, don't think the prophetic. Everything you hear from God is not a prophecy. All right. And when you think prophetic, don't always think hearing God. All right. The prophetic is a gift that can be an activation. And um, the prophetic is uh, universal. Um, there are people who are psychics who have prophetic giftings. There are people who are wizards who have prophetic giftings that are not submitted to God. So the prophetic is a universal medium. All right. Now, when you're dealing with the prophetic, you want to know what is the source of that prophetic. All right. Is it false prophetic? Is it demonically prophetic? All right. Or is it divine? You want to know that. So how can you teach someone to prophesy? But first, I want you to know that the real prophetic is an overflow of hearing God. All right. And I want to say that because a lot of people want to be prophetic, but they don't want to know God. And that's backwards because the spirit of prophecy, Revelations 19 and 10, is the, is the uh, testimony of Jesus. All right. The true prophetic leads people to Jesus and is sourced from him. I'm saying it again. The true prophetic leads people to Jesus and is sourced from him. All right. Remember in the Old Testament, it says, if a prophet says something, says, give your word, says something, and it comes to pass, but they lead you astray, then that, pro that prophet is a false prophet. All right. So there are um, prophetics that are accurate and that are precise, um, but it leads people astray. All right. Like if I say, hey, um, if I tell you everything you did yesterday, everything you did all your life, and I tell you what your name is, your middle name is, and I, and I say, now I want you to worship me because God wants you to, to worship me, then I'm obviously a false prophet. All right. So, um, yeah. So a lot of people want the prophetic, but they don't want God. And when people become like that, there are two scriptures that come to mind when I, when I make that statement. What statement? The statement I just made. A lot of people want the prophetic, but they don't want God. There are two scriptures that come to mind. The first is in Ezekiel when he says, If you come to a prophet with idolatry in your heart, God would allow the prophet to prophesy to you based on the idolatry of your heart. So God would allow the prophet to tell you what you want to hear. Why? Because you don't want God. You want a prophecy. All right. Now, another scripture comes to mind. God said in Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah, I'm not giving you the chapter or the verse. Do your homework. All right. In the book of Jeremiah, he says, listen, I'm mad at the prophets. He said, I'm mad at the prophets because they make up prophecies. They tell people what they want to hear. But he said, you know what? I'm more mad at the people because the people like it that way. He said, listen, I got an issue with the prophets, but I got an issue with the people because the people want the, fa the false prophecies. The people don't want me. They want the prophets to tell them whatever they want them to hear. They want the prophets to just give them something that entertains them, just give them something that makes them feel better about being in the sin they know they shouldn't be in. They want, they want the fluff. They want the hype. They want, so I have an issue with the people. All right. So, um. Yeah, so there are people that want the prophetic, but they do not want God. All right, so uh, I had to make that clear. But yes, you can be trained in the prophetic. First Corinthians, I'm um, looking at my notes. Where is this? First Corinthians 14 and 31. It says, I wish that you all prophesy one by one. Why? That you may learn. It is saying that the prophetic can be learned. All right. 
the prophetic can be learned. All right, Hebrews 5 and 14, it says uh, that by reason of use, that your spiritual senses be exercised or literally practice. All right, the word usage literally means practice in the original language. So he's saying you can practice becoming spiritually sensitive. And whatever you don't use, you will lose. All right. So he's saying sharpen your spiritual senses by practice. How do you do that? You need a safe environment. All right. Uh, Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Hagen, um, Kenneth Hagen had what he called believers meetings. Those were only for Christians. Why? Because they needed safe environments um, to be activated in the gift, to uh, be allowed to flow in the gift without the criticism of the world all right so it is biblical that you can learn and you should learn and be trained in the prophetic whatever job you work i do not want a doctor practicing on me who has not went to medical school i do not want a lawyer who has not went to law school and i do not want a prophet who's not been to the school of the prophets. I need to know that your gift is working and that you're not practicing prophecy. It's okay for you to practice prophecy, but don't do it as a professional, all right? So lose the business cards, dump the website, all right? Drop the title and keep practicing until someone credible, not um, so-and-so from around the corner that had a school of prophets and even credited, uh, someone, credi someone credible acknowledges and endorses your calling as a prophet all right so um yeah so you can learn all right now let's jump into this now prophetic activation i want to give you some disclaimers first of all just because you act you're activated in the prophetic it does not make you a prophet okay now i teach this over and over and over again if that doesn't make sense to you please read my book uh, Prophets 101. Go get it. All right. Go get Prophets 101. It does not make you a, a prophet. All right. So be comfortable with doing the stuff without having to have a position. All right. Um, just be comfortable with that. Uh, you do not have to be a prophet to function accurately in the prophetic. All right. You do not have to be that. Um, and you do not need a title to feel more important. All right, so get delivered from that and uh, realize that you hearing God does not validate you as an officer of heaven. All right, so stop that because the difference between Saul and David, um, when they sin, one lost his kingdom, the other didn't. Why? Because David sinned against God's holiness, but Saul sinned against God's authority. He sinned against God's government, all right? He was in the office of the king. There were only pretty much three offices in the Old Testament, the king, the prophet, and the priest, all right? The king, the prophet, and the priest, all right? He was a king. He was in order to be a king. He was proficient as a king. He was not a prophet. He was not a priest. So it was not his job to go into the tabernacle and make a sacrifice of a prophet or a priest. But he got impatient and he stepped into an office that he was not called to. All right. And then uh, Samuel had to come and rebuke him and say, this day um, the kingdom has been taken from you. And then he said, um, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness, the sin of idolatry. All right. So only stubborn, rebellious people intrude into offices. All right. Just be comfortable doing the stuff. All right. All right. Do not. Um, intrude into places that you've not been authorized to um, uh, stand in that particular office. It's okay. It doesn't take anything from you, all right? And putting the title in, in front of your name doesn't add anything to you, all right? So we just, that really irks me, all right? Can we just be sons of God, all right? The earth is not looking for more prophets. The earth is looking for sons of God, all right? And God uses prophets to release the prophetic, all right? So let them bear their responsibility and you just do the stuff, all right? You just get the impartation. You just get the activation and you function in the stuff you can do the stuff you can call out the names you can call out the addresses you can do all that all right 
but don't let that make you so ambitious to jump into ministry. Right? It says don't be ambitious, the Bible says, to be a teacher or a preacher because they will be judged more strictly. All right, so God wants to activate you in the prophetic to empower you to impact your sphere of influence. Not to jump in a pulpit, but to Im let's try impacting our home first. Let's try uh, changing our neighborhood first. Let's try, um, let's try um, changing our schools. Let's try impacting our, our um, places of employment. Let's try that first, all right? Because most people who jump into an office that they're not called or ready for, they become where they look and appear to people as public successes, but they become private failures, all right? So don't go trying to save the world and you lose your own house. All right, so um, relax, calm down. This is for you to be anointed to function and impact or function in the prophetic in a way that impacts your sphere. This don't give you the right to tell your pastor that you hear stuff from God that he ain't hearing. This don't give you a right to go tell your bishop that you should uh, be ordained as a prophet and you need a uh, seat on the front row. This don't give you the right to none of that. Right? This is to empower you to hear God and be more effective in the prophetic as a believer. All right? So it does not make you a prophet. I can teach on that all day until I'm blue in the face. Um, so go read the book, Prophets 101. Number two, just because you're activated in the prophetic, it does not mean that everybody should listen to everything you think God is saying. No, stop that. All right? Stop pulling the God card. You heard of the Trump card? Well, stop pulling the God card. People are not going to hell because they ignored something you think God told them. No, that's wrong. That's a demon. People are not missing God because you had a dream and you barely got the interpretation and then you want to give them a prophetic word. No, that's off. All right. So just because you're activated in the prophetic, listen, if all prophetic revelation undergoes scrutiny. So if you cannot handle criticism or correction, then you may want to leave the prophetic thing alone. All right? Because the Bible says, let one prophesy, let two or three, and let the others judge. So whenever you say you have a word from the Lord, God doesn't expect people to just take your word. God doesn't just expect people to live off every word that proceeded out of your mouth. All right? So calm down. I know you, you're hearing God. I know you're seeing visions. I know you, you, you think you're deep. But God ain't about to punish nobody because they ain't listen to your prophecy. You're not even proven yet. All right? The Bible says make full proof of your ministry. All right? So God doesn't obligate anyone to listen to you on any subject that you're not proven in, that you haven't gained credibility in, that you have not been endorsed in. All right? So um, chill out. Calm down. And if it really is God, then guess what? Everyone's going to know it. God will prove uh, his word through your life. All right? But just because you're activated in the prophetic doesn't mean everyone is opposed to to accept everything you say as God. Now, how do you start hearing God more clearly? Now, I was going to go into ranks of revelation. and um, But write this down. 1 Corinthians 14, 29. That's when it says, when you prophesy, that prophetic word is going to be judged. When you prophesy, that prophetic word is going to be judged. All right? There's no such thing as thus saith the Lord, God told me to tell you, and you need to listen to me, and that's just that on that. It don't exist. All right? Prophecy undergoes scrutiny. Prophecy undergoes criticism. All right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Should I deal with the ranks of revelation? Should I deal with the ranks of revelation? What do I mean by the ranks of revelation? I want, let me deal with that really quick. I dealt with it before. Now, if you're just tuning in, I want you to go watch, or everyone, I want you to watch a video I have on YouTube. It's on Gina Barku's page. Uh, her name is spelled, B, her last name, Barku, is spelled like Barcourt, B-A-R-C-O-U-R-T. It's called Four Secrets of Prophetic Accuracy. It is a profound teaching. Every prophetic person, everyone who ever wanted to hear the voice of God, think you hear the voice of God, wants to hear the voice of God more clearly, you need to go listen to that uh, teaching on YouTube, Four Secrets of Prophetic Accuracy. All right, that's going to help you. Yeah, it's going to really help you. Yeah, prophetic accuracy. Someone said profound accuracy. Four Secrets of Prophetic Accuracy. Yes, you have to listen to it. It is a blessing. All right. So, uh, I think I dealt, I, I've dealt with this, I don't know if it ever made it to YouTube, but I'm going to just barely tap, you know, tap it, touch it just a little bit. Um, the ranks of revelation. Why am I dealing with this? Because you have to understand just because you feel like God's telling you something, people shouldn't stake their lives on it. All right. They shouldn't do that. They shouldn't rearrange their lives to your prophecy and you're not proven yet. All right. There are ranks to revelation. Where do I find it? I find that in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6. It says, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to them in visions and dreams and dark speeches, similitudes, um, Parabolic language, metaphorical speech, um, com comparisons. God speaks to them through comparisons, dreams, interpretations, visions. But he said, but Moses is not so. All right. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, plainly and apparently. So here it is, God is ranking the way he speaks to Moses versus the way he speaks to Miriam and Aaron. Because Miriam and Aaron felt like, well, they said it out of their own mouth, the Bible records. And they said, are we not prophets just like Moses? They started comparing themselves. They said, doesn't God speak to us just like he speaks to you? And, um, hold on one second. And they were out of order. They were out of order. Where are my notes? So God said, hold on now. You still trying to interpret when I'm talking to you, what I'm saying to you. Moses hears me clearly, plainly. And when I speak to him, it is what it is. You still got dream books. You still don't understand what this meant. You still, and you have the nerve to compare your authority with his. They're ranked to revelation. But look at it. You have dreams. First of all, dreams and visions, um, most of the ways, well, let me say it like this. The primary way God speaks in the scripture is through the seer's dimension. All right? Through the seer's dimension. All right? And when you're dealing with the seer's dimension, you're dealing with dreams and visions, a lot of stuff come into that category. All right? Most supernatural encounters came in visions and trances. All right. So whether it's an angel, uh, what even all of the voice of God, people were in visions and God spoke to them honorably. All right. So when you're dealing with dreams and visions, you're dealing with a host of things. So let me give you a, a quick scale of the ranks of revelation. Okay. If I come to you and say, God spoke to me and, and I had a witness or I felt in my spirit. I said, God spoke this to me. And you say, well, God showed me a dream. Guess what? Your dream outranks my witness. Why? Because my spirit can be off. And in a dream, you're unconscious. Did you get that? Now, if you come to me and say, I had a dream, 
God told me this about a specific subject. And I say, well, I saw a vision and God told me something else about this subject. Guess what? My vision outranks your dream. If you come to me and say, well, an angel appeared to me and brought me a message. And I come to you and say, well, I had a vision about this message. Guess what? Your angel outranks my vision. If I come to you and say, the Lord appeared to me face to face and gave me this message. And you say, well, the angel came to me and gave me this message. Guess what? My Jesus outranks your angel. So that ranks the revelation. That ranks the revelation. And I always wondered. It wasn't until I understood that. Now, if that was too deep for you, then hopefully you can find the video on YouTube where I explain it more clearly. A lot of people come to my God told them God haven't even spoken to them in a context where authority was administered to them, where they've been sent to bear their message. So they have no authority to expect you to arrange your life around that prophetic message. Yeah. So um, that's what happened with the young prophet and the old prophet in the Bible. Am I helping you all or what? Am I helping you all or what? Someone said, now I know I'm not crazy. Someone said, that's deep. Yes, 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 sir. Yes, you are. Yes, yes, Jesus. Okay, good. That's all I need to know. If you're just joining, share this with your followers. Um, share this on Twitter. Share it on Facebook. Um, I know a lot of people jump on. They have to get off. They're at work. I know people may be at work. They may be on their way home early. So remember, you can watch the replay. If you're watching now, you can't stay on long. You can watch the replay, and you can fast forward, and you can pick off where you left off. All right? But in the meantime, share it, and people who join on now, then they can go watch the beginning. People who join on later, or if you leave and have to come back, then you can watch the replay. You can fast forward to the part you missed. Thank God for Periscope and that new feature. And yeah. Now, uh, what was I saying? The old prophet and the young prophet. When, you remember the young prophet? God told him, go by the way, go this way, don't turn aside, don't turn back, go to the destination I told you. And then an old prophet showed up and said, an angel came to me and said, uh, that you are to come eat, to eat in my house. So the young prophet aborted what God had told him and went to the old prophet's house. And when he said to eat with him, the old prophet switched on him and said, thus said the Lord, because you disobeyed, um, uh, you're going to be uh, consumed in a way by a lion. And when the young prophet left and a lion ate him alive. All right. He was judged because he didn't understand this truth. And that, that story, you know, that sound, that story always sounded so mean to me. I mean, it sounded like, man, where's the mercy? Uh, like, man, is it that serious? I mean, I, I just never understood that until I understood the revelation of the ranks of revelation. What do you mean by that? See, what do you mean by that? God himself spoke to the young prophet. The old prophet came and said an angel spoke to him. Which one carried more weight and authority? God or the angel? All right, Selah. You can take that home. Yeah. It makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Makes sense. All right, um, now let's activate you. Are you ready to be activated? All right, so don't go getting titles. Don't go telling your pastor, um, I'm hearing God. And you ain't listening to him. And you ain't doing right. Listen, calm down. Get in order. This does not give you the license to pull rank on people. All right, so I'm not teaching people to be activated in the prophetic to feel like all of a sudden um, they've been exalted to some level spiritually where they can um, call the shots in other people's lives, especially in other people's churches. 
If you don't think your pastor is hearing God, guess what? Go to another church. All right. Because as for him in his house, um, you ain't got no authority to be t saying what's God and what's not. Yeah. That didn't come out exactly how I wanted it to come out. But you get the point. Someone said, do a scope on order. Yeah. Man, it irks me. That irks me. I, You know, and when it happens, we give the prophetic a bad name. We give the prophetic all around a bad name. If you feel like God's talking to you, then just sit down, sit on it. If it's God, it will come to pass. And then the people will actually know, oh, maybe the next time I should listen to them. Until then, just be a watchman on the wall. And get your spirit right. Don't be up telling people in the church your prophetic visions and everything you're saying is opposite of what the pastor is saying. That's an Absalom spirit. Absalom gave counsel in areas of authority that he did not have authority in. All right. So uh, you got to watch out for that because that's a spirit that comes at the prophetic. Absalom, not just Jezebel. Absalom. All right. Now, nobody in your church need to be hearing your prophetic revelations that have not been sanctioned by the head of that ministry. And if God's that serious about judging that church, you need to leave and wipe the dust off on your feet and let it happen. Because let me tell you something. If they ain't listening to God, they show me about to listen to you. So you're, you're getting off into a witchcraft and a manipulation and a control and an Absalom spirit because you don't understand protocol. All right. So, um, yeah. Am I helping you? I hope I am. Yeah. This is good. Okay. Amen. Yes, 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 indeed. Yes, thank you. Great. Now, let's get activated. Let's get activated. Number one, I've dealt with this before. I'm going to run through it quick. If you miss it, if you need more clarity, if you want to um, me to expound on it more, then read my book, Learning the Language of God. Profound book. All right. Matter of fact, I have 15 prophetic activations in that book in the last chapter. And I have an activation prayer that I took from my private prayer closet. Then I pray over my own self. All right. So I gave you access into my private prayer journal in the last chapter of that book. I think it's the last two chapters. One is a prayer. One is 15 activations. All right. I have seven personal activations that you can do. At home, without a prayer partner, I have seven um, um, activations that you can do with a prophetic company of people. Of course, that prophetic company needs to be authorized by your leadership. All right, you don't need to have this prophetic corner of people that your pastor don't even know about. You know, just safeguards in the spirit. Especially when you're learning, it's safeguards in the spirit. All right, and then I have one um, prophetic activation for the corporate body of Christ. So pastor, looking at me, watching me, um, and you want your church to be more acclimated to the prophetic, then, you know, start applying that activation. Um, start uh, using that activation on your, in your Sunday morning service times, or at least your Bible study, and do it consistently. And just tell the people, hey, we're going to we're going to activate in the prophetic and uh, we want to sharpen ourselves in the prophetic anointing and just do it habitually. At least every Bible study or you can if your church is more acclimated to the prophetic, then you can even do it on Sunday mornings like near a benediction or it can be it'll make a great activation um, right after you preach or after there's been altar ministry or during altar ministry 
or right before the benediction. It'll make a great prophetic activation, a good way to go home, a good way to seal the word of the Lord over your congregation. So get the book, Learning the Language of God, Learning the Language of God, Learning the Language of God. And don't forget Prophets 101. Get that as well. Um, yeah, but let me go through these really quick. How to hear God more clearly. And then I'm going to do activation. And then we're done. All right. Number one, first you got to believe he's already talking. You're not trying to get God to talk. He's always talking. All right. The voice of God is like a radio, uh, XM radio satellite. It's always feeding. All right. The question is, are you tuned in? So hearing God is not about you getting him to talk. It's about you tuning in to what he's already saying. You have to have faith that he's already talking. So that when you get into prayer, you realize that prayer is a dialogue, not a monologue. So if you're doing all the talking, then guess what? Um, who you're not giving the chance to speak to you. Right? So, um, yeah. So when you get in that context of prayer and you start talking to God, then you, you give time to listen. You give time to listen and hear what he has to say. Ecclesiastes said, um, it says, uh, when you go to prayer, be slow to speak and be quick to listen. All right. So uh, you have to allow God time to speak. You have to steal yourself and quiet yourself. And um, in that book, Learning the Language of God, I give you five ways to position yourself. Five ways to position yourself to begin to hear God more clearly. All right. And it involves reading the word, all that kind of stuff, finding a quiet place. All right. So number one, you know, he's already talking. You have to start with that. I don't care if you never felt like you heard the voice of God. I don't care if you do not. If, if you never heard the voice of God, you must renew your mind in that area and start and change your perspective and start believing in the reality that God is already talking. Yes, he is talking right now. All right. And for some of you, um, that's your word from the Lord. Number two, and I list these different, I, li I have a, I have, well, let me say it first. Number two, um, in order to hear God more clearly, you have to understand, you no, know, you have to learn the different ways that he speaks. And I have a list of ways that God speaks in that same book, learning the language of God with scripture reference. All right. So you learn the different ways he speaks. Why? Because if you're expecting to hear God, his honorable voice, and he may want to show you a vision, then um, I say this all the time. A lot of times people are waiting to hear the voice of God, but they're listening with the wrong ear. Back in chapter 2, it says, I will stand on my watch to see what the Lord will say. All right. So there's an eye in your ear. All right. So a lot of times you want to hear God and he's not going to speak to you. He's going to show you something. So that's just two different ways. You can hear God. You can see a vision. You can have an inner witness. You can have an angelic messenger. Um, it's a host of ways. So I have a list of ways with scriptural references in the book, Learning the Language of God. Number three, after you learn the different ways he speaks, that's going to increase your capacity to position yourself in a way where you're going to be more aware that God is talking if he starts speaking to you in a way that you're not accustomed to. Because if you're waiting to hear him, sometimes you're going to miss him. All right. Sometimes you're just going to know and you need to know the different ways that he speaks. So number three, now, after you learn the different ways he speaks, you need to learn the different ways he speaks to you the most. All right. Learn the different ways he speaks to you the most. It's very important. Are you a seer? Are you a hearer? Are you a dreamer of dreams? Some people don't even dream dreams, but they can interpret them really good. All right. Are you an interpreter? Are you a psalmist? Some of you, you, you won't hear God until you start singing your song. Oh, I just set somebody free right there. You, you, may, you may just be being a little too religious. You really need to hear God. You get in your little prayer closet. And guess what? Ain't no prophetic oil in your closet because that ain't your prophetic administration. Your prophetic administration is that of a psalmist 
And David, if you pick up your violin, maybe he just may start speaking through your own mouth. See, David would start singing. He would be depressed. And he would start singing, Lord, you know, my enemies are after me. And the same, out of the same mouth that he was complaining about his trials, he started prophesying about his solution. I prophesy that if you sing your song of worship, the same mouth that wants to complain about the issue is the same mouth that's going to start prophesying your own solution. All right. So some of you, um, your administration of hearing God is that it uh, is in that of song. Others of you is your minstrel. You have to play. What do you do? You play the keyboard. I don't care if you play a flute. If it gets you to the place where you are still enough to know that he is God, then play that flute until you start hearing the voice of God. All right. But sometimes you got to Sometimes you position yourself with music. Some other times people. Um, now I know that's the devil. I don't know. And that better not be that prophet that called you from five different numbers. Interrupting my periscope asking for a seed offering. All right. Now, um, yeah. What was I saying? Other people, you, um, go hard or go home. People are still calling me. Yeah. Now, watch this. So, um, what was I saying? It's back. Okay. You don't like when it happens? I don't either. So, yeah, so learn the way he speaks to you most. Does he speak to you when you're worshiping? Does he speak to you when you're praying? Does he speak to you when you're writing? Does he speak to you? Does he send you angels? Does he... Um, Um, yeah does he speak to you when you're writing do you have more angelic messengers does the Lord come to you face to face do you have trances do you see dreams learn the way he speaks to you the most right? and learn the patterns learn the cycles learn the seasons and the timings that you dream the most learn it, archive it, record it take note of it Observe it. Pay attention. Hearken. That's what it means to hearken to the voice of the Lord your God. The word hearken means to pay attention. Pay attention how he's talking. All right? Because if he's coming out of a bush, then you got to be ready to turn aside and see the bush that's burning. All right? And that's, that may have went over some people's head. But oh well. Yeah. Now, Number four, be open to however he wants to speak to you, period. All right, so the third one was know how he speaks to you most. The fourth one is be open to however he wants to speak to you. That's the fourth way you learn how to hear God's voice more clearly. All right, be open to however he wants to speak to you. Because sometimes we get a little too rigid. And we can be expecting to have a dream or to interpret a dream or see an angel. And God comes a completely different way. Moses said, Lord, show me your face. He said, you can't see my face in there, but I'll show you my backside. What was he saying? I'm going to show you a side of me you've never seen. Sometimes God will show you a side of him you have never seen before. And you have to be willing to adjust to however God is willing to reveal himself. All right. In Jesus' name. Be open. That's good. So don't get rigid. Don't get stuck. Don't become a professional dream interpreter. Don't become a professional angelic messenger. Don't become a professional, I talk to Jesus face to face all the time. Don't become, listen, however he wants to speak, be open. Yeah. Now, let's activate. Are you ready? What is this? Hold on one second. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> you coming to daddy? Now, we talk about prophetic activation. Now, I, I told you I believe in activation according to uh, 1 Corinthians 14. 
Careful. First Corinthians 14 and uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Let me see. Come here. Now, if you be good, you can stay up here. All right. Say hey. All right. She has a little cold, so her nose may run every now and then. You want to play with this? Yeah. Now, activation. There's a thin line between activation and conjuring. All right. And the more, now, I'm not bashing activations, all right? I just want to give you uh, a biblically proficient way to activate your prophetic gifting, all right? Now, this is coming from the guy who has 15 prophetic activations in one of his books, all right? So I'm not bashing it. But the more I begin to do those prophetic activations, the more I realize the oil ain't flowing. I was just in Jackson, and we were doing activations in the hotel room. <laughs> I mean, it was off. I mean, I was off. Everybody was off. We were trying to guess what books of the Bible we were picking. <laughs> and if you're not careful, activation will just become a bunch of guessing. And um, the point is, what's that scripture Lord gave me about this? Oh, yeah, that's right. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Yeah. So, um... When Paul told Timothy to stir up the gift that was in him, he said, give yourself completely over to the gift. He didn't say do a couple of prophetic activations and then maybe you're going to be more accurate. No, because if you do that, you'll think that if you do a certain method, God going to talk to you more. And no method, no activation will replace relationship with him. So I was looking at the scripture Today, the Lord spoke to me. He said, um, activation is not about some prophetic methods we use to try to practice the prophetic. When he said, give yourself completely to the gift, he's saying there are some disciplines that you become acclimated to in prayer and in the presence of the Lord that should um, translate in your everyday life. Give yourself completely to the gift that's inside of you. So these, these, these disciplines, such as prayer, reading the word of God, all right, these are two ways you activate in the prophetic. Prayer. Why? Because when you talk to him, he talks back to you. Not blindfold somebody, I mean, some of this stuff sound like, I mean, some off of, a, out of a Masonic Lodge. Nah, you know, it's cool. I'm just, I'm, I'm saying this stuff for shock value. All right. Not turn your bag and see who, prophes you know, prophesy to somebody behind you that you can't see. I mean, oh man, I'd be making people mad when I say stuff like this. But I enjoy tearing down that foolishness. All right. So just help me. Um. Yeah, but try praying. If you have a prophetic presby presbytery, presbytery, uh, prophetic company, a school of the prophets, try taking them into prayer. You know, <laughs> try taking them in the spirit and not playing musical chairs and uh, hot potato. That's what it sounds like. You're going to pass this paper around and then you're going to open it and then whoever you get, you're going to prophesy to them. You know, you turn your chair around, put this blindfold on. Uh, guess what we thought about last summer? You know, it's like, man, that's scary. And we were in this hotel room. And I was like, man, this is dumb. Like, this is like, now, nah, if, if that floats your boat, it floats your boat. I'm not saying it's a sin for doing it, all right? I'm just saying that I, the more I did that stuff, the more I realized. Now, every blue moon, we would get it right. But the more I realize I'm most accurate when I'm in the anointing. So if he's saying, give yourself to your gift, all right, by meditating on the, in the word, meditating in doctrine, he's saying there's some disciplines out of prayer that sharpen your gift that you need to translate in your everyday habits. That's how you 
get activated in the prophetic. All right. Prayer. Because when you start talking to him, guess what? He's going to start talking back to you. He will start talking back to you. Another one. The word of God. Why? The same voice you hear while you're reading the word of God is going to be the same voice you hear when God tells you to say something to somebody. And you only become familiar with that voice in the word because faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of God. So hearing and the word of God are two different things. He didn't say faith come by hearing the word. It says faith come by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of God. In other words, hearing is a faculty that is produced from the word of God. If you get in the word of God, you will start hearing. There's a lot of people that know the word, but they don't have faith. Faith is prophetic. Faith is supernatural. Now I get into a whole other revelation about that. That's why when people read the scripture, it says now faith is a substance of things hoped for. They emphasize the wrong part. They shout people off of now faith. All right. Okay. I get it now. Yeah. But let's try putting emphasis on the word substance. Faith is the substance of the things hoped for. Faith takes something that's invisible, puts substance around it so it can become tangible in your world. That's supernatural. So faith is supernatural. Faith is prophetic. In Romans chapter 12, you prophesy according to the proportion of your faith. All right? Because the more you get in the word of God, the more you're going to hear. But if you're not in the word, then I don't know what you're hearing. So I'm, I'm just trying to sharpen my gift. No, you, you're, you're, you're in a familiar spirit, sir. You're dibbling, dabbling up in some other thing. Because the parameters of your hearing should be the word of God. Not a blind folder, not a piece of paper, not a journal that you pass around, not these group of seven people that get together every Saturday and try to prophesy to each other. No. Yeah. Now, here's another thing that you activate the prophetic. And see, we were in that hotel room trying to do these activations, and I like activations. You know, they're good if you apply prayer in the Word of God with them. I'm not saying something wrong with activations, okay? Hear me clear. They're good if you apply prayer in the Word of God with them. But thinking you're just going to just do this magic potion and poof, you know, you're going to be prophetic overnight. I don't know what you're tapping into. Yeah. But, um, yeah, if you're, and I, and, and I ain't talking about let's hold hands and pray before we activate. And you do a 10 minute prayer and you do a one hour activation. That's a demon. Maybe you're so religious, that's why you ain't hearing the voice of God. Maybe try praying an hour and doing a 15 minute activation. Because when it's all said and done, Amos chapter 3, the Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? If he don't talk, you can't say nothing. You can activate till you're blue in the face. But if he don't talk, you can't, you don't have nothing to say. Yeah. Hallelujah. I hope that sets somebody free. Yeah. So uh, here's another thing that we avoid when it comes to activation. And this is the thin line between activation and conjuring. I told you, go hard or go home. All right. Now, here's the thin line between activation and conjuring. Witnessing. Revelations 19 and 10. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Try telling somebody about Jesus. The more you witness to people, the more you're going to have insight prophetically into their lives. Because God is going to start showing you things to verify that he's sending you to talk to them. That's the best way to activate. Try evangelizing. And my God deliver us from all these prophets that don't want to evangelize. That's backwards. How? What, when, when do we start producing these prophets that don't want to evangelize? Where'd that come from? And, and, and God, God help us with these apostles. The apostles were the leading evangelists in the New Testament. They were the leading harvesters. So that, that you know, that strikes a nerve with me. 
I mean, and I see apostles and prophets, and all they do is sit up in the boardroom. All they do is talk about lunch and churches, and but no one's talking about getting the harvest. That is scary. That is scary. All right. So, um, yeah, you got to get out the walls. I see you. Somebody saying you got to get out the walls. Yeah. And if you and, and if and if you're only expecting people to get saved when they come to your revival, that is sad, sir. All right. We pass by people every day at the grocery store. We pass by people every day at the mall. We pass by people every day at work. We pass by people every day in our neighborhoods. We pass by people every day. And the only time you want to talk about Jesus is at the conference, the prophetic conference. There's something wrong with that. No wonder we're not accurate. No wonder God ain't talking. He ain't got nothing to say to us. Because everything he has to say, we're not telling it to the people who he wants to hear it. We're just preaching to the choir and prophesying to the usher board. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm talking. Yeah. But um, witness, witnessing. So we, we came right from Jackson, Mississippi, doing those activations in the hotel room, and nothing was popping off. And I got home, and we had interactions with a young lady who was being beat by her boyfriend. And I began to minister to her. And after all them activations, I ain't get nothing in the hotel room trying to do activations. But as soon as I was moved by compassion and started witnessing to a young lady that needs to know Jesus, immediately my driver's license passed before me. And I began to tell her how her boyfriend doesn't have his driver's license and how he was going to go to jail for beating her and how um, he was a self-centered, uh, spoiled little brat that wants everything his way. That's why he gets angry all the times and beat her. And she broke down crying. It's the same lady that broke down crying to my wife um, saying she, she was backslidden and she wanted to get closer to God. Why did the prophetic pop off like that? Because I was witnessing. Now in that hotel room in Jackson, Mississippi, I was trying to, I had three guys with me. I was trying to teach them how to get sharp in the prophetic. Oh, it was dry. Oh God, it was like Ichabod up in there. I mean, we weren't hearing nothing from the Lord. But as soon as I started dealing where the need was, God started talking. So you want to be sharp in the prophetic? Start witnessing the people. All right? And just prophesy. Now, let me give you some disclaimers. Now, I, 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 now when you're witnessing the people, especially when you're being activated in the prophetic, don't go telling people, God told you. Don't go saying, thus saith the Lord. I got to say this before I end. Don't go saying, I heard the Lord say, cut all that out, please. Because when you get it wrong and you're talking to a sinner, you're talking to someone that's backslidden or borderline or don't know if it's real or not, you embarrassing God. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, let me, let me, let me tell you what to do. When you're prophesying to people and you're, act, you're being activated in the prophetic, don't make anything right or wrong. Try asking more questions. Now, I know that goes against the grain because I know, I know people tell you if you're prophesying, you shouldn't be asking questions. The only problem with that is uh, everybody that says that because they think they're um, somebody mastered the prophetic. I don't know people that say that. I know they're not accurate. They're general. You know, all right, try asking questions. Try saying, hey, um, is, this some, is this something going on in your marriage? Or is this something going on with your career? Or did you just lose your job? Don't come out the gate saying, God told me you lost your job and he about to give you a new one. And then they say, I have a job <laughs> or I don't need a new job, you know, so stop pulling the God card. Yeah. Stop pulling the God card. All right. 
Um, take, take out of your language stuff like God told me, thus saith the Lord. I heard the Spirit say, take all that out of your language. All right? Until your, your, until your prophecies are proven. All right? Use stuff like, use words like, I believe, I sense, does this make sense to you? Um, I see or I hear. All right? So we don't make a fool out of all of us. Someone say, I only say God is saying. Yeah, so take the pressure off yourself. Yeah, I feel, I sense, I believe, I see, I hear. You know what the best, even more than uh, I see and I hear. Because I see and I hear is kind of authoritative itself. Because you're, you're claiming that you heard something in the spirit and you probably have not. You're claiming that you've seen something in the spirit and you probably have not. You should probably say something like, this thought came to me when I was thinking about you. Does this make sense to you? And guess what? If you're off, if you're wrong, no harm done. But you sit there saying, God told me, I saw this in the spirit. The Lord showed me this last night. You scaring people. You got them confused. Now you got them nervous. And especially all y'all all, all, all all is telling people who they should marry. Please stop it. And please don't get married off no prophecy. Please. All right? Because when the prophecy comes to pass, you're married now. Guess what? You still got to live married. <laughs> After that prophecy comes to pass, guess what? You're married now. I's married now. All right? So stop getting married off prophecies. And stop telling, I don't know why I'm saying this. Stop telling that man God showed you that he's your husband in the dream. Please. All right. Now I'm going to get off of that. But I hope you enjoyed this activation. I hope this blessed your, your soul today. And I hope you get delivered from prophecies about marriage. All right. Who is that in the background? That's my wife <laughs> and Jessica. We're about to have a staff meeting. So love you guys. I guess I won't get the questions this time. Maybe next time. But I'll be back on. I got a lot. Oh, I got a lot. I, you know, every now and then I'm going to overload. So like, it's like I said, mm, I may be on here again tonight maybe twice a day for a minute. But listen, if y'all don't see me on here, nothing happened. The world hadn't ended. I'm just focusing, all right? And I'm just seeking the Lord. Someone said something about Tampa. Reconciliation of marriage? No, because that's a choice too. I guess I'm going. I thought I saw something about Tampa. When I'm coming back to Bishop Long Church, I don't know. You may have to call him and say, hey, bring the prophet in. Please come to Tampa. I may be in Tampa soon. I know I saw something about Tampa. Greetings from Holland. I see you, Tampa. What about Paris? Prayer, perhaps? No, you pray. You all go to your own special closet, wherever you pray, and seek the Lord. I'm going to go. All right. <laughs>